conversations. Um, today, I'm very, very pleased to have um, colleagues and friends um, talk to you about an important book that they just wrote, that they um, finished recently and was published very recently, came out recently in the US. So I'm just going to introduce each of them and then they will give a presentation. Henry is here in person and all that is on Zoom from the UK. Um, so I'll just introduce uh, both of them at once so that we can um, um, dispose with the formalities and get right into the really interesting discussion uh, about Ukraine. Um, so first of all, Dr. Olga Anuk is Senior Lecturer in Politics at the University of Manchester. In 2021, she was visiting Siri at the CERES at the University of Toronto as a Senior Research Associate. That's the Center for the Study of um, the regional politics uh, for, of the region. From 2014 to 2020, she was an associate member of Nuffield College at Oxford. And since 2017, she's been an affiliate of, and previously in 2014, a fellow of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. In 2017, she was a visiting fellow at the Davis Center um, at Harvard. And she is the winner of the 2017 Political Studies Association National Sir Bernard Crick Award for Outstanding Teaching. Um, so um, congratulations on that. And um, uh, here's the book, I'm just gonna hold it up. And the second author of the book is Henry Hale. He's a professor of political science and international affairs at George Washington University. His research has won two prizes from the American Political Science Association. And um, before co-authoring this book, uh, the Zelensky Effect, he has authored books in, um, including Patronal Politics, Eurasian Regime Dynamics in Comparative Perspective, The Foundations of Ethnic Politics, both of these were published by Cambridge, and the third book, Why Not Parties in Russia, also published by Cambridge. Uh, he is currently principal investigator of the Program on New Approaches to Research and Security in Eurasia, better known as CODERS, Eurasia and he is director of GW's Petrak program on Ukraine, and also editorial board chair of Demokratizatia, the journal of post-Soviet democratization, um, and chief editor of the textbook developments in Russian politics, which we've all used in our teaching. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, turn the floor over to Ola, uh, and she will begin, um, she will begin uh, the formal part of the presentation, and after the authors speak, then we'll move to a question and answer period. Um, okay, welcome everyone and um, enjoy. All that. Thank you. Thank you, Elise. And, and thank you for putting up with my having to be virtual. If I had a choice, I would certainly want to be there with you in person. Uh, but I did buy this little book that has photos of Manchester in New York. And it's a game to figure out. Trust me, you know which ones are New York right away and which ones are Manchester. But you know, maybe the Mancunians. Anyways, uh, I thought that was a little funny thing that I found today on all days uh, and uh, to make up for the fact that I'm not there in person. The other thing I'd like to mention before we start, today is the one year anniversary of the liberation of Bucha. Um, we know that this has been a, a horrible atrocity that was committed in Bucha. We know that over a thousand people were murdered and we know that investigations are ongoing. And I think it's really important to take a minute and just really take in the fact that our friends, our family members uh, are from places like Bucha, in fact. Uh, we even mentioned this in the book. Um, for the eagle-eyed, you can look for that reference uh, when Bucha was a happy place for us. And so I'd like you just to take a moment and think about this and just remember um, about what is happening. Well, I'm gonna go into a little bit of a presentation uh, about the book. And I'm gonna start off with an image that many of you are probably familiar with. And just to give you an idea of what is the Zelensky effect and why we thought it was so important to tell the story of the Zelensky effect uh, to, to the world. 
not only to political scientists, hopefully, uh, but certainly first and foremost to political scientists and area studies folks. So fearless, earnest, Russian target number one, the man in the green t-shirt or jumper as it might be here. As Russia's brutal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine unfolds real time on screens worldwide, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has captured the global imagination like no one else. Just three years ago, Zelensky was still a television star whose main qualifications, it seemed, for running for Ukraine's presidency was having played one on TV. The Kremlin saw him as a pushover. Rarely has a politician so visibly surprised so many. The thing is that what is making him extraordinary in war comes actually from his very ordinariness as a Ukrainian. He inherits a tradition of dissent and fierce civic sense that is baked into the country's identity. And it, he is a Ukrainian every person in that way, albeit in a way that few others could be. So for us, Zelensky is the product of a civic nation. And he was able to act so bravely as the, some of the videos that are often used to depict this because he knew what nation he was part of. He knew the nation that made him. He fully understood that ethno-linguistic divisions and polarizations in Ukraine were much more political fodder for elections than real interactions or problems in the society. He knew that the sense of civic identity and state attachment was always high in Ukraine. He also knew that from that very beginning, people continuously from 1991 onwards, Ukrainians continuously came to identify themselves with the Ukrainian state. And in fact, the largest jump in the early 1990s came in so-called Russophone, Russian-speaking cities across the country. He also knew the incredible history of activism and dissidents in the country. He knew that this was a history that predated 2014, 2004, and actually could carry out through the centuries. He knew that the dissidents as displayed on this map were from all parts of the country and not simply from the Western Ukrainian phone parts of the country. In fact, the plurality of dissidents were from the center East and South of the country. He was also part of this generation, the independence generation as we call them in the book. These weren't necessarily the young men and women who sat out on uh, the independent square Maidan in, in Kiev in uh, 1990 and 1991 throughout a wave of series of protests. Uh, they were those who were between maybe the ages of nine and 14 or thereabouts. Uh, they were people, quite frankly, from my generation, those who are in their 40s today. And what was different about them is that they had the living memory of what it was to live under Soviet rule. And they had the living memory of those early years of transition and the multiple attempts at bringing greater democracy to Ukraine, often led by its people. They remember the 1990s and this other generation that came to power those that were perhaps in their 20s and 30s at the time and accumulated immense wealth, but also immense political power. They recall those early years of euphoria, but also those years where the foreign policy fortunes of Ukraine perhaps were decided by others, or perhaps Ukraine didn't have as much agency in those decisions as it would have liked to. And they will certainly remember, because most of them were around the age of 18, when horrific events such as the beheading of Grigori Gongadze took place. They remember the dark times of the early years of democratic transition in Ukraine. And they participated, perhaps not Zelensky himself in 2004, 
but repeatedly in mass mobilizations, be it in the 2000-2001 Ukraine bez Kuchmy, Ukraine without Kuchma protests, be it in the Orange Revolution in 2004, or in the multiple protest events that followed and the mass mobilization of 2014. But they also remember those moments, again, of euphoria, followed by moments of disappointment. When politicians gave into fighting themselves rather than pushing for certain policies, quite frankly, perhaps not being powerful enough to push the policies that they would have liked to. They remember that the villain of the Orange Revolution comes to power. And this is around the time when we see Zelensky himself becoming more and more politicized. Uh, certainly, other activists were first to rise in 2014, other political leaders, other journalists, other groups of social movement organizations. But we do know that Zelensky and his Kvartal friends were, in fact, participants of the Evromaidan. But once again, the Evromaidan was followed by a period uh, of not only coming together of cross-cleavage coalition of the young and old in Ukraine, but also a period of not only war, but also severe economic decline. And some of the, one of the worst uh, downturns uh, in, economic, in, in the economy of the country was actually in the aftermath of the Evromaidan and throughout the beginning of the first year and a half of war. And childhood poverty particularly uh, was immense at the time. Why do we know all this? Well, because Zelensky himself has told us, is telling us, and has told us in his appearances uh, as president, but also in some of his political theater, drama, and television shows. And we, of course, did extensive research to get at this. We collected all of Zelensky's speeches that we had at the time of writing this book. And we conducted content analysis and key moments of discourse analysis to find out exactly what Zelensky is talking about. And we did the, a similar discourse and content analysis of uh, the Servant of the People series. And we find that a lot of the same messaging is there. He talks about that which unites Ukrainians is stronger than that which divides them. He front loads civic unity, civic identity, and civic duty. Duty to defend Ukraine, duty to defend the Ukrainian state, and duty to defend Ukraine's democracy and its European path. It's really incredible what took place in those early years of his presidency. What we really saw is a profound Ukrainization of an Eastern Ukrainian Russophone, but also this doubling down on the import of civic engagement and civic duty. And so when February 24th, 2002 came along, I am certain that President Zelensky was not surprised that the content of his speeches was being lived out in the streets and in the steps of Ukraine. Be it his, uh, the, and, and just to make a note here, neither the substance nor the style of Zelensky's speeches pre-February 24th and post-February 24th changes. In fact, the content and very much the style, although he did wear a black turtleneck more often back in 2019 instead of a green t-shirt, but even the green t-shirt shows up in earlier days. And so he certainly wasn't surprised um, by the tractors or by the elderly Ukrainians trying to stop tractor uh, try tanks with their bare hands. Uh, and he certainly wouldn't have been surprised by the fact that near 80% of the civilian population of Ukraine are engaged in the war effort and somehow. And when we ask them in our own surveys, how are they engaged in the war effort? Yes, the broad majority told us about making donations, volunteering in the community, uh, perhaps even engaging in civilian resistance. But many, many, many decided to tell us in open text answers 
the very particular ways that they were engaged, the very personal ways that they were engaged. In one instance, that was the making of a hearty soup for the army. In another instance, that was making Molotov cocktails or camouflage. And in one particularly endearing instance, it, as we write about it in the book, um, was an elderly person from the southeast of Ukraine reporting that they milked their goatlings because the protein found in that milk is particularly good and that will help the boys and girls in the army. He also wouldn't have been surprised to know that between uh, 2019 and 2022, civic duty to engage in elections, to protest, to engage in civil society activities was actually on the rise quite profoundly. And perhaps most of all, he wasn't surprised to know that the number of you, the percentage of Ukrainians that supported democracy also rose in that period. When Zelensky takes office, about 41% of the Ukrainian population supported democracy when asked which of the following statements do you agree with most? Democracy is preferable to any kind of government. Under some circumstances, an authoritarian government can be preferable to a democratic one. And for people like me, it doesn't matter whether we have a democratic or non-democratic regime. On the eve of the war, the all-out war that, be, that began in, on February 24th, of last year. Our survey was in the field at, on February 16th. It came back. So on that, in that time, 60% of the Ukrainian population believed in democracy as being the best system for the country. And who were those people? They were people from the Southeast of the country the movers, those who became Democrats. They were those who voted for Sluha Narodu, the servant of the people, the president's party, or for the president himself. They were also people who came to believe that Euro-Atlanticist policies were the best for Ukraine and that Ukraine, uh, and, and that they have a civic duty to engage in democracy. So that's the Zelensky effect, the very real Zelensky effect. But as I noted, he is a product of that long history of Ukrainian independence and civic engagement. So the Zelensky effect is like two sides on, of the same coin. On the one hand, it's that very real effect that Zelensky had on a very particular constituency, the one, the constituency that is on the front lines of this war, the people that are experiencing some of the worst atrocities. And he brought them to the democratic European vision for Ukraine. On the other hand, it is the civic nation that made Zelensky who he is today, because quite frankly, there's about 44 million Zelenskys. Thank you. So now we're going to pass it to Henry. We do this thing. We, one day we'll do this live and it will be great. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, so I don't need a mic or anything, right? Can, I don't think so. Everybody can okay. hear him. All right. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. So um, I, I guess like I think what I'll do is just follow up on what uh, Olya said by just talking a little bit about the, the book itself and the kind of idea uh, behind it, how it unfolds. Um, and so basically, uh, we, even though the title is Zelensky from the center, um, we didn't write the book to be a straight biography of him. Um, and instead, it's more of a history of independent Ukraine uh, told through the story of Zelensky, um, the story of this larger generation of which he is a part that Olya talked about, the independence generation, um, and the, the people as a whole. So you know, we, we got our hands on as much public opinion data as we could, a lot of which we've been analyzing for a long time. Before this, that was how we were able to pull together a book so quickly as we've been doing research on all these themes and then suddenly these events occurred that made everything super relevant and so uh, we just greatly decided to try to pull it together as best we could um so um and and our argument of course is as Oli mentioned that um these things are all interlinked right it's like you know this is not a story of kind of the heroic Zelensky single-handedly defeating the Russians uh you know instead it's really a story about the nation of Ukraine but he reflects 
uh, key aspects of Ukraine, Ukrainian identity, um, and does so in a particularly uh, important way, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more. And so, you know, what he's doing is he's both reflecting, but he's also amplifying certain aspects of Ukrainian uh, identity um, and certain aspects of Ukrainian society. Um, so I mean, the first chapter is just an overview, uh, primarily kind of encapsulates a lot of the argument and the motivation for what we're interested in. And I'll, again, I'll come to in a minute, some of the key uh, arguments that are there. Um, Oli has mentioned some, but I'll, I'll highlight a few others and put some of them in context. Um, the second chapter then is a, uh, a story of the, the independence generation, which really takes us from Ukraine, uh, you know, pro primarily from its gaining of independence in 1991 with the Soviet collapse, a little bit what happened before that, um, all the way through the uh, Orange Revolution. Um, and tracing events through the, the you have the Kuchma era, um, the Orange Revolution basically being an effort to try and overcome the autocratizing impulses that were there. Um, but then uh, the next chapter, uh, chapter three, we, we entitled Orange is the New Corruption um, because of the vast disappointment that people felt in Ukraine about the outcome of the Orange Revolution. It was widely reported in the West as this democratic breakthrough. And uh, for people in Ukraine, especially you know, millions who are out on the streets protesting um, large shares of the population, they expected this to be a turning point. Um, unfortunately, while it did get rid of the dictator and you did have a period of um, what in the book we call kind of a, a patronal democracy, which is basically, you know, this is, I mean, elsewhere I've, I've characterized this, we allude to this in the book is, it's a kind of democracy um, where it's, it's as much a competition between different political machines as it is a, a competition among ideologies and ideas. You know, you have all these um, political economic networks that are out there uh, kind of combining business and politics. They're buying stories in mass media. There are oligarchs who are big business people who um, have their own media and they're all slanted coverage. But um, in Russia, by contrast, all of these forces are all oriented around the authority of one person, whereas in Ukraine, it's very pluralist. And so you have all of these different groups struggling against each other. And what happens is they're also fighting for ideas. They're advancing different ideas. So there's a pluralism of, of, of media sources. Um, and uh, in the end, all the different sides are strong enough to keep each other from falsifying the vote. And so strikingly, in most of the cases, Ukraine's votes are actually counted pretty honestly, and this gives the people a real voice in what happens. So that's how it's it's not a liberal democracy in, in the sense that there's this really strong um, you know, rule of law, at least at this period, but um, it is a form of democracy. Um, but it was one that people found very dissatisfying in Ukraine um, because of the level of corruption that was there. And because there was so much infighting, um, the different political forces couldn't get along with each other. And this is something that was very formative for this independence generation that Olya was talking about and for Zelensky uh, in, in particular, um, you know, making note of all this. Um, and so it, it was so disappointing that people freely and fairly returned Viktor Yanukovych to power. And this was the guy who had tried to steal the election um, with his patron Leonid Kuchma in the 2004 elections that had prompted the Orange Revolution. So already, just a few years later, they voted the old guy back in because he was presenting this image of, well, let's have a return to normalcy. Let's just stop all this infighting. And he kind of recast himself as a veteran fatherly figure. Um, but of course, once he got into power, he started um, manipulating the system in a, in a very uh, potent way um, to build up his own um, coalition of forces, kind of forcing all these different pluralistic oligarchs and other forces um, to recognize his authority and work uh, for him. And then, you know, again, he went too far in the end. Um, and uh, this is the, the story of the, of the Euromaidan uh, mass mobilization and ultimately um, the, uh, the, the, the downfall of, of the Yanukovych regime. And again, this is, there's, I'm happy, I'm sure Olya is happy to talk about any of this in, in a lot more detail. Um, but, uh, you know, among other things, this was a period when Russia um, was starting to put the screws really hard on countries around it, in particular Ukraine, but also others like Armenia, um, to try and keep them from moving towards Europe. And um, basically under that pressure, Yanukovych had called a, 
uh, a suspension, which most people understood as a halt towards the process of joining the European Union, or at least aspiring to join the European Union, because they didn't have candidate status yet, but working in that direction, and in particular concluding a, a big, uh, a free, deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. And when he did that, that led to a, a, a spark of mass protests. And um, then Yanukovych reacted in many ways, which just made things worse, in particular, um, just brutally repressing the activists. And that got even more people out into the streets. And before you knew it, he was he was gone. Um, so that's uh, really the story of chapter three and the, and the first part of chapter four. Um, and then, uh, of course, Russia reacted to these events by seizing Crimea, uh, annexing it, and uh, instigating uh, the, the conflict in the Donbass, and basically sending in its troops to facilitate the occupation of, of, the, of certain parts of, 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 of eastern uh, Ukraine. And it was, so it was during this period that Zelensky really started to enter politics in a more direct way. And so in the book, we talk about a lot of the unconventional way in which he did kind of enter uh, politics because you know he was we emphasize in the book that he wasn't just a comedian as was often kind of reported right but you know he was actually a uh, a major media mogul uh, he was the general producer at one point of Ukraine's most popular television station uh, in, in, during the Yanukovych era so that meant he was responsible for news content at the time when news was really uh, you know, very suspect to say the least. And, you know, he obviously had some uh, uh, you know, discomfort about this because when asked about it, he said, well, in the end, what I decided to do was um, delegate authority over the news to somebody else. And what I was working on was the um, satire component because he was producing all these satirical shows. And so he basically said, the political stuff is all in the news, but our show is going to tell the truth. But of course, this is also kind of an uncomfortable position. But what I think all this shows is that, you know, he was a political figure and he was very much involved in, in politics. He, was, he knew what he was dealing with. And to be a star in Ukrainian politics on television means you have to deal with these big oligarchic figures. And he says as much, you know, there's no other choice because there aren't any television stations in Ukraine that had any audience um, that uh, were not owned by one of these figures and all of them were uh, quite uh, uh, sus, right? A little sus suspicious type uh, characters. Um, but he starts after 2014 in particular using his messages to really hammer home this pro-European message. And this was something I think that was often uh, missed in coverage of him, which emphasized that he was a Russian speaker uh, from Eastern Ukraine, uh, but, the, the, the content of the shows that he was producing had this very um, sophisticated and very powerful um, pro-European message. Um, and um, so I'll, I'll come back to that just in, in a minute. Um, but basically show how he developed this idea, in particular, this um, pro-European message of Ukrainian identity. And the, and the message, as Olya was talking about, was um, a vision of Ukraine whereby Ukrainian identity wasn't really about language or religion because all, you know, there's a lot of diversity in Ukraine. And so he was kind of really boldly embracing this diversity and saying what makes us Ukrainian is the unity of our experience as Ukrainians. And we have a distinct history from Russians. And interestingly enough, a lot of the skits in his shows and um, are, are all about this, are about kind of like, you know, striking certain uh, kind of resonances and references to common Ukrainian events in history that people would all remember together, but that Russians wouldn't really remember because they weren't part of their history. And, and reinforcing this as an identity. So he really was, in many ways, an identity entrepreneur, um, if you could put it that way. Although, you know, again, our point is not that he made this identity, but that, you know, it more it made him, but he was picking up on something. And really emphasizing it, and it really resonated. And it resonated partly because his political opponents were doing something very different. Um, and so the you know, his main political opponent at the time was the incumbent president, uh, Poroshenko, who you know, we point out in the book did many great things for Ukraine that many, you know, launched the decentralization campaign, military reforms, things that have paid off for Ukraine now. Um, but, you know, his vision of Ukraine that he was advocating was a much more uh, ethno-cultural a vision for Ukraine. And so, you know, Zelensky's, you know, we argue was much more resonant with the, 
vast majority of the Ukrainian population. And so um, chapter five then addresses his campaign for the presidency. And um, we talk about how this particular identity vision was a, a large part of why he won in, in the end um, the largest margin of victory in Ukrainian presidential election um, history over uh, over Poroshenko. And so you know, his was a, a message that was much more in step. Um, and then chapter six, uh, we examine his presidency, how he fared, um, you know, and, and on, the, on the whole, uh, you know, we argue it was uh, kind of a mixed bag, right? There were a lot of missteps. Uh, but if you compare him to other Ukrainian presidents, he actually did quite well. Um, his popularity had gone down. But if you compare him to the, the, what he was at year three before the invasion and where Poroshenko was at year three and the other Ukrainian presidents, he was actually doing a lot better than the others coping with these problems. Plus, you figure he had to deal with the pandemic which was something that none of the others uh, had to deal with. So he was surprising a lot of people, um, even though a lot of people weren't happy uh, about him. Um, but then of course, uh, chapter seven, we talk about uh, him in the war. Uh, I won't go into that right now, because Olya has already talked about that in, in the messaging, but we, you know, we show that there's this continuity in um, his leadership style that just happened also to be very effective in war, um, you know, including just his, his communications abilities, uh, you know, the, the types of messages, social media use, like all these things that he was very adept at uh, much early on. And that was also something that really distinguished him from his rivals in the presidential race. And he was much more in tune with how, especially younger people, but most people got were starting to get their information uh, than were his political opponents. And so and then chapter eight talks about, um, we call it thinking about Ukraine's future history. Um, his history is actually an interesting theme in a lot of his work. Uh, if you've had a chance to see his Servant of the People uh, television show, which I highly recommend, uh, extremely entertaining. Um, and uh, but plus, it just it's informative both to see kind of where things are now. Um, uh, you know, obviously, it's not a literal representation of what Ukraine was like, but you learn a lot about it. Uh, and, um, you know, he, his character, uh, who became an accidental president, um, was a history teacher. And so there's constantly themes of history back in the, in the series that started in 2015. Um, and he constantly references history and the importance of learning from history. And so we uh, make an argument about that. Um, and uh, so just let, let me just um, run through very quickly a few contributions to um, current debates and theory that we try to make in our, in our book. Um, you know, one, of course, is why Ukraine uh, successfully mobilized, uh, resisted, um, and ultimately stood up to the, the Russian army and what Zelensky's role was, right? This is a lot of what Olya has talked about. This is, of course, the core question of the book. Um, we also uh, have explanations in here about, uh, you know, why Russia started the war and when, um, and why the timing was there in February of 2022. It's not a book about Russia, but I think you can't understand what Putin was doing without looking at what's going on in Ukraine. And, um, you know, just to maybe oversimplify it just a little bit, um, if you put yourself in the position of Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin in 2019, looking at Zelensky getting elected, um, there's all indication that they were almost lethal, right? They were thinking, great, you know, we have this sort of, uh, you know, nationalist defeated, right? Poroshenko defeated by a Russian speaker. And not only a Russian speaker, but someone of Jewish heritage, right? You can't expect somebody like that to really care about Ukraine that much uh, to fight for it. Plus, you know, he's a Russian speaker. He had been calling for peace. He had been calling for negotiations with Russia um, to try and end the war. And that's where one of the things we argue, you know, he, in retrospect, seems pretty naive about that going into the uh, election. But this was there was an appetite for this in Ukraine at the time as well. Um, and so the Kremlin kind of thought they were getting what they wanted, um, especially when you toss in that, you know, he's, he's just a comedian, right? Um, you know, Putin even kind of mocked him a couple of times in uh, not so subtle ways, uh, you know, complimenting him as an actor, uh, but, you know, basically giving him the back of the hand and saying, well, you really have to know what you're doing um, as a leader of state. But um, the story of Zelensky's presidency is uh, also a story of, I think the Kremlin realizing that they completely misinterpreted this uh, because instead of um, caving into Russia or even negotiating and giving concessions to Russia um, or 
even presenting a, a generally vaguely Russian oriented agenda, um, Zelensky's agenda was, you know, very firmly uh, pro European. He not only continued, but even accelerated a lot of the uh, Poroshenko era reforms, including in language and uh, things like uh, blocking certain Russian cultural content in Ukraine that he had been expected to block. Um, one of his own films that he starred in was banned because it had a, one of his co-stars had uh, gone to Crimea, I think it was, and basically was declared persona non grata. And, and so they banned his own television station, right? Or his own, his own movie, I mean. Um, and so he continued a lot of these things. And um, so, so I think this was a process through which the Kremlin started to realize, okay, you know, that was our last best chance at getting what we want through anything other than military means. And then COVID hit, probably delayed things. And then um, you get the mobilization after that. Uh, so I think that that's a good possibility as to why you get the timing uh, when you did. Um, so we also talk a lot about why um, you know, there, there was so much of this was a surprise. Um, Oli has already talked about this. Uh, of course, many did predict, certainly here, the intelligence community predicted that um, uh, Russia was going to invade you know, leading up to February of, of last year. Um, but uh, many or even most of those who predicted the invasion also predicted that Ukraine would fall uh, within you know, a few days um, and would be over, easily overrun. And so you know, some of the uh, things that we argue uh, were gotten wrong in a lot of the policy community, but um, you know, we can point to a lot of scholarship that had been done and that was out there by many great researchers um, that should have been consulted and probably would have led to a different conclusion that was out there. And, um, you know, one was this uh, mistaken uh, equation of uh, language with loyalty to the state. And Elise at a presentation yesterday, like, was talking about this. And I, I think it's absolutely right is that uh, a lot of people, including Putin, thought that, um, you know, that Russian speakers, people whose first language was Russian, were ultimately not really going to be loyal to the Ukrainian state and that would they be sympathetic to Russia. Um, but, you know, that, that proved, of course, to be very wrong. Um, there, are, the, the the nature of the division in Ukraine was uh, not understood uh, properly. Um, you know, there certainly were disagreements in Ukraine, and and you know they 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 were kind of patterned in some way along regions. But the polarization was really had more to do with the way that certain questions were framed that made it looked a lot more bipolar uh, than it actually was. In fact, there's a lot of gray area, and Zelensky was tapping into this kind of messy middle. Um, and, uh, you know, there's political competition, even fierce divides between political forces in most democracies. Um, but, uh, you know, what everybody in Ukraine agreed on, I mean, almost everybody, um, was they didn't want to be ruled by Moscow. And even a lot of the pro-Russian politicians that were advocating closer relations with Russia and integration into certain Russian economic structures, when Russia invaded, um, quickly made clear that they were on Ukraine side. Um, you know, so there was actually, it's interesting, I mean, only a small fraction of the, the pro-Russian forces in Ukraine actually defected to uh, Russia, um, you know, even in those early days before it became clear that Ukraine is going to uh, hold out. Um, I've already talked about the trope of Zelensky as being just a comedian, uh, which we argue actually overlooks a lot in his biography, including, I mean, he had political interests very on. Um, you know, he, he, um, his, his degree was in law, uh, in e economics. Uh, and then his entertainment was the hobby that he pursued, basically, but then it became his career. And uh, but even that career had a lot of political content because it was a lot about political uh, commentary. So he was new to electoral politics, um, but not new to you know, the idea of politics. He wanted to be a diplomat when he was a kid before, um, you know, in, in, in really until uh, college, I think, uh, you know, that, that he uh, until he decided to shift to the entertainment track. Um, we also talk about um, rallying around the flag uh, because you know now we see this big rally, right? His popularity went up from you know kind of thirty percent approval um, in, just before uh, the uh, kind of all-out invasion to you know, close to ninety percent approval. Um, and we try to use some uh, statistical techniques involving um, survey experiments and randomization to um, check to see how many of these people are really strong supporters of him and how many are just Kind of setting aside their differences and there's a substantial number that are just setting aside their differences and you know you'll hear people talk about that right because like what what the invasion has done basically is to 
reduce everybody to the common denominator, which is we don't want to be ruled by Moscow. We oppose this brutal, uh, bloody invasion. Um, but differences remain underneath. Um, there are some fierce opponents of Zelensky who are really not happy that he's the one that wound up in charge, but they recognize the necessity of his leadership. And a lot of them grudgingly accept that he um, has been the right person for this job because of what's happened. Although, you know, they would still point out uh, certain uh, mistakes. And so, but what they'll all, almost all say is that, okay, we're a democracy. After the war, there's going to be a lot of political debate and a lot of discussion. But right now, we're just setting uh, all that aside. And so, um, you know, we, we think that there, there is a danger for Ukrainian democracy after the war. I mean, there's always a danger um, that, uh, you know, martial law could give somebody too much of an appetite for power. If, if Zelensky comes out of it super popular, you know, maybe he'll um, try to use this to, you know, translate into more political authority. But partly what we show is that there's, there's a latent opposition there that's going to call in on all this. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think that there. Um, you know, we, we hope that he would do the right thing in the end, right, and, and preserve democracy and, and stick for the ideals that he had voiced throughout his political career. Um, but even if he doesn't, uh, you know, there, there's still a, a strong basis for um, democracy in, in Ukraine in terms of the, the you know, there, there's political opposition, um, you know, there's diversity of political forces. Um, and... Um, yeah, I think maybe um, I will just uh, wrap up on that. I mean, there's a lot we talk about kind of election politics and how Zelensky won the election, which is actually a totally arguably unique way to win the presidency in, in, in Ukraine. Um, and uh, but let's uh, just maybe open it up now. And okay. uh, thank you for uh, joining us in the discussion. Okay, um, great. Thank you. I, I'm just going to make uh, one comment question before uh, opening to the audience. Um, I guess. While you're speaking, it occurs to me that this is the second time in Zelensky's brief political career that he managed to unite the population behind him, you know, first during the election and now uh, with the war, where you, you see a kind of um, really, and, and what's so interesting about that is with the election, you know, one of his main campaigns, what uh, uh, um, platforms was to end the war in Donbass. Um, so he's somewhat of an un unlikely um, kind of wartime leader in a sense. And that's just uh, something interesting to know. But what I wanted to ask you was, I, I was uh, researching in Ukraine before he was elected. And so I, I wasn't surprised about how popular parts of his platform was since I did my research in the Southeast. And, um, but I also noticed that um, I was in Russia right after his election. And I asked uh, journalists there, you know, what, um, how, how do you think Russian people understand Zelensky? And she said, oh, they just think he's a clown. And I said, well, that's interesting because I hear that term all the time in Ukraine also applied to him. He's just a clown. But don't take him seriously. And so I wanted to ask you a little bit about that idea that uh, maybe there's a, I think, like a kind of fissure um, within Ukrainian um, elite among people who, you know, look down on his form of lowbrow humor. And you make a lot of this kind of generate him being representative, collective of a new generation. But could you maybe talk about a, a different kind of... Um, uh, I don't want to call it divide, that's overstating, but a different kind of um, constellation of, of uh, I, I don't know, identity or outlook among Ukrainians in which there is a, there's a, there's a kind of, um, well, he's, you know, he's not of the, of the more erudite intellectual class. He's a, he's a kind of, um, you know, a humorist of the, of a, of a, a lower brow nature. And then you still hear now a lot, I can't tell you how many interviews in English I hear about Ukraine, where the person is sort of like, he's a great wartime leader, a Ukrainian person, uh, but I probably won't vote for him again. You know, and when I hear this, I kind of, I feel right back in that place where people are kind of like, well, yeah, he's just a comedian. So I just wanted to see, you know, especially Olga, if you could sort of talk about some of the, how you, it's a sensitive issue now, right? It's wartime, but if you could talk about maybe some of the um, fissures or just sort of constellation of, of outlook among the elite or people who are really quite influential among Ukrainian elite and um, kind of political class in Kiev vis-a-vis uh, -vis Zelensky or of course you. Yeah, no, no, I've no, yeah. talked for a while. It's like, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, we, we can both answer this. I, I mean, I'm sure we both have something to say on this. Um, so, I mean, I think the whole point is there's two things. There are some folks who underestimate him, uh, not only in Ukraine, but also internationally. Uh, and that's one thing. Underestimating him. Uh, there are others 
who see him through a lens of kind of this affective polarization lens, us versus them, the Russian speakers in this country versus the Ukrainian speakers. That, that That's an element of, uh, I think, the way some people perceive him in 2019 and continue to perceive him today. And some of those people aren't willing to be upfront, actually, about what are the you know, at least publicly, I think at least one of the last times I was uh, speaking to an audience in New York, um, just down the street the other way, I, I was, I mentioned in 2019 that um, my own family has had very lively, uh, let's call them conversations <laughs> over dinner table, uh, and uh outrage, right? The kinds of conversations and the things that people would tell each other in private settings, they weren't about his in, uh, intellectual ability or or these things. They were really about him being a, so, a, a homo sovieticus identity type person, um, him being a Russian speaker, uh, him being part of the problem and not actually speaking Ukrainian, not promoting Ukrainian culture and ethno-linguistic uh, culture in Ukraine. So I think that is much more uh, what many of his opponents did in 2019 think about and continue to think about today. And let's be clear, that group is a minority group in Ukraine. It is about 2025, 20, maybe a little bit more, but just about that percent. Um, and when we're talking about the electorate, it is very much tied to a very particular constituency for the most part, and in a very particular part of the country. Um, quite frankly, in most in Western Ukraine, but mostly in Lviv Oblast, right? Uh, to be very particular about it. And I think that that is that is something important. The issue that uh, the majority of Ukrainian public intellectuals um, uh, journalists, uh, opinion leaders, civil society leaders also tend to a come from central Western Ukraine for the broad majority, but also are also believe that perhaps the promotion of Ukrainian language, Ukrainian culture should be primary to politics as well. Um, that's a di that's a different story, and they do tend to be vocal. They they have been very vocal, and they have in the past talked about more about him being a clown or comedian um, uh, and focusing on some skits, but not others, conveniently overlooking, uh, like Henry mentioned, that really, um, I think, really impressive coverage of Ukrainian history from Skovoroda to others, um, dissidents being mentioned in, in, in the series Servant of the People repeatedly, um, and focusing on some on the slapstick comedy, right? And that's an active choice that people make. Um, this has changed for some folks. Uh, there are those who were part of this constituency in February 2022 that have publicly, privately, in some cases, only privately, in some cases, even publicly, admitted that they were wrong about the intellectual substantive elements of Zelensky as well, right? So there is that group that has changed, and I, I don't want to mention particular names, but some of the most famous opponents of his in the, the public intellectual world um, did make this tack. They, for the first time, started to look at his campaign and see it through a different lens. They started to review even his skits and 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 the servant of the people and seeing that there was something very different about the, uh, what the message was there. And I think most profoundly, people are starting to realize, and I think this is, I'm surprised that his opponents, quite frankly, didn't make a bigger deal of this, that he was the general producer of Inter. Inter was not only the largest television network, most important television network with the most watched news channel, but with the most watched television channels in Ukraine. It was owned by oligarchs and it was an incredibly powerful political tool. Yeah. And he was at the helm of that network. He was a power player in that sense. And those years are still not really well known. They're definitely under-researched. And to me, it was a shock that his opponents didn't 
uh, focus on that. Perhaps they didn't focus on that because that would make uh, Poroshenko's claims during the campaign that this will not be an adequate leader uh, fall flat, right? Um, but I think uh, a lot has changed among some uh, members of that constituency that were severe opponents. Uh, whereas the the I think the the hardcore has remained the same. And the last thing I want to say is this doesn't mean that people do not criticize the multitude of mistakes that he, his party, his administration, um, individuals within the administration, individuals with diff in different ministries have made. And I think that's ongoing. I think the test of Zelensky today and in the months and years to come is, does he clean his house? How does he clean his house? And is he able to cooperate with at least some opposition groups that are willing to work with him on a bipartisan basis? That's me. Sorry, that was long. <laughs> uh, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll just add one quick thing, which is about kind of the lowbrowness of the humor. Um, you know, I mean, I've heard it compared to like Benny Hill and uh, other things like really kind of it's a lot of body stuff, um, but it's hugely popular. Right. And I think, you know, you think about American elections. Right. You know, there's kind of the the, the trope of kind of who would you want to have a beer with. Right. And, um, you know, for somebody like that, you seem more in touch with kind of you know, a large number of people by not seeming highbrow. And one feature of his campaign that was really, really interesting, um, I mean, if you compare him to like other comedians, we'll call him a comedian now, to, that went into politics, right? So I'm from Minnesota originally. Um, so Al Franken, uh, you know, sort of my, you know, kind of a person from my homeland. When he went into politics, right, um, he altered his persona. I mean, he tried... He avoided telling jokes because he didn't want to appear not serious. Zelensky did the exact opposite. He continued doing everything just as he already did. Um, you know, the, the, the show where he, you know, is in, in, he, you know, he's announcing his candidacy and he's appearing in a blue snowsuit like a little kid jumping around on the stage. Um, and uh, they were broadcasting all his comedy shows. So, you know, he didn't make any pretense about trying to appear serious. And on one hand, uh, you know, this clearly worked, but on the other hand, to a lot of people, it made him look like he wasn't a serious person. Uh, person. Yeah. And so I've heard that a number of times and say, well, this campaign just looked like a joke. He wasn't even campaigning. But part of what we argue is that's exactly the point is, um, you know, he had a television show that portrayed him as president and gave him the ability to communicate how he might govern, including dealing with mistakes that he would inevitably make in, you know, laying out this vision for Ukrainian identity that was played out on the, the third and final um, season of the show during the campaign, right? So he didn't have to do the traditional things that a, a campaigner does, um, but this was working for him, but it, it wound up it being interpreted by others as sort of, well, you know, he's not serious. Um, and, uh, you know, and then this kind of reaction against the lowbrow humor among kind of the more educated classes among others. Um, so anyway, a lot to be said, but I'll just Stop okay. in the interest. Yes, so please yeah. introduce yourself and um, it's trying to be a little bit concise just because he's got a play to catch. Uh, so we're going to have about half an hour. And yes, okay. Hi, I'm um, Alex Younger. I was head of British intelligence during this uh, time and working with Zelensky. And we, we talked a lot about why Putin did what he did when he did it and was the list. But there's one aspect I'd like to try out on you, and I'm open minded about this, which is Zelensky's effect in Russia. And his status is like the anti Putin, right? So if you think of Putin as not being um, a comedian, <laughs> feeling solely in misery, <laughs> and commanding respect simply because of the brutality of his regime and his ability to keep away bad stuff, but with no positive respect as a leaden communicator, old, and definitely not the star of a TV show. This guy turns up. I know he's seen as a, as a clown. Well, but actually, that was also the yeah. message of the He's government. also the anti-Putin. He's young, he's telegenic, he's optimistic. He has a real perspective. And I, a, a theory I have heard, but I'm open-minded, I love your view, is that one of the reasons Putin felt he had to move was that it was kind of impossible to, con to contemplate into the medium term something like this being seen to have succeeded in Ukraine, or the example, positive contrast that that would face next to Putin's sort of miserable, miserable is that is that over optimistic or is that a reasonable hypothesis? 
Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I, I mean, I should go back and look to see if I could find any, you know, opinion polls on Zelensky. I mean, he was very popular in Russia. I mean, as, as a, as a, you know, as a, a star and a producer, um, so he was well known. Um, but I guess my my sense is that like most Russians didn't think him a serious politician yes, so they, because that was the message, right, that was coming out of the Kremlin and. You know, from their perspective, I mean, that's mostly how they knew him. You know, they didn't know him as a big media producer. You know, they they saw him as a, as a comedian. You know, someone who did the kind of Kava N and, and comedy networks. And so, you know, my my sense is that um, the population kind of just bought this idea that he really wasn't serious. And um, so, I, I doubt that they would have seen him really as a threat. But again, in the bigger picture, I do think that for Russia, a successful Ukraine on a different track, you know, is a threat. And um, the, the, the idea that he seemed to be leading them, you know, in a different direction, potentially to have success if Russia didn't intervene, um, would weigh on Kremlin decision making. Um, you know, just as now, I think that, that you know, he exemplifies, you know, we write in the book, that he kind of gives the lie to the Kremlin narrative, like almost nobody else could, because here he is, this um, Russian-speaking Ukrainian of, of Jewish heritage, who's standing up braver than anyone uh, for Ukrainian independence. Um, you know, whereas if it had been sort of Ukrainian-speaking leader, um, who you know was, I mean, you know, the, the people are bilingual, right? So I don't want to overemphasize the linguistic divide, but you know, if it had been someone from Ukraine's West who was leading and a Ukrainian speaker. Um, you know, it might have been easier to sell the idea, especially abroad, right, where people didn't know that much that, um, you know, this this wasn't a whole Ukrainian wide uprising because people don't get all the information. But for him to be leading this resistance, it makes it impossible for Putin even to claim and really that, uh, you know, he's fighting on behalf of Russian speakers. Um, so I don't know, Olya, if you want to. I, I, I think I will have that note forever in my notebook. Putin miserable, Zelensky telegenic. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, I, I actually, I, I think that's interesting, Henry, and we never had a conversation about this generally. So I think this is actually something for us to think about a little bit more. But I, I think I agree with Henry more that this was very much about Ukraine more so. Um, and I, I think what's important a lot, so, so, so recently, uh, it, uh, several of our colleagues are pointing out that um, identification with Ukrainian native language has gone up, Ukrainian practice, both at home and in the workplace, has gone up. So more people are at least declaring in surveys that they are speaking Ukrainian than have in the past, and that there's this Ukrainization happening of uh, of a, and, and it's civic in nature, um, as Volodymyr Kulik pointed out in some recent surveys that he 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 wrote about. Um, that's happening now since 2022. But uh, actually, this last week, I checked the data that we've had since uh, 2014, and then several waves of a panel that uh, uh, of part of the Mobilize project, and we actually see also this increase, the start of the increase of people shifting. To and, and the neat thing about our panel um, and mobilize is that we have it from 2019 and then we have it in 2020, 2021, and 2022. Um, and that increase in people declaring Ukrainian language practice starts happening around uh, after 2019 as well, right? So a lot of these things start out during his presidency, and I think it's not so much him personally I don't believe that you know my friend my friend who is from Dnipro herself she firmly believes that he was put on this earth to unite Ukraine and he had he's on a mission from God um I don't think it's about him personally but I do think it is about this thing that in political science is our son our daughter uh element he was in fact a had a very ordinary upbringing from the southeast of the country. He was a typically Russophone person. Um, he was not ethnically Ukrainian, and he was not perceived to be connected to any of these things throughout his more popular public life. And yet he actually, and this is something we didn't talk as much in the book, but I think is more important today, he actually underwent a Ukrainianization himself that was very public, right? Right. 
and here I'd like to just mention one one moment in that um fo just following that skit in the blue snowsuit. <laughs> I think Hen that's one of Henry's favorite skits. <laughs> um, but it when you know the, the scenes change and he comes out in a suit uh and he says, Now I'm going to be speaking to you as Vladimir Zelensky. And that's the last time he calls himself pretty much in public Vladimir Zelensky, right? From that point forward, he is Vladimir Zelensky. And I think that trajectory of that our son, our daughter, really not only did he embody many of the things that people believed in when it came to their civic attachment, but he also gave an example of how they can be included into this broader Ukrainian uh, nation. And then it became really difficult to use any of the disinformation tactics that may have used in the past, that may have worked in the past. That it is because you are ethnically Russian or a, a, a Russian speaker that you are um, living in poverty in the East or whatever it may have been. And I think when that worked in Ukraine, it also perhaps became a dangerous thing that somebody, not Zelensky himself, but somebody could use a similar tactic in Russia, not focusing on Russian imperial history, nationalism, but maybe focusing on other things that might perhaps unite uh, the broader Russian population. But that would be interesting to see if that's the case and if there's any indication. Uh, I, I have no idea. I don't, I don't study Russia, but that might have been the fear that somebody could copy uh, what Zelensky was doing. Hadass. Uh, I'm Hadass Iran, uh, and I have uh, two questions. One is a bit of a follow-up. I wasn't even planning to ask it, but I had a feeling when the war began that one of the reasons why the popularity or the, the affection toward Ukraine is so high in the beginning of the war is because uh, because of uh, the Putin, not so much in the sense that he's so photogenic or telegenic, but because he's not, he's like the opposite of a toxic masculinity. Because there is something very soft about him and Jewish. <laughs> I'm also Jewish, I feel like I can say that, but it's not the most like muscly type of uh, type of identity. And he's, he's smaller, and yes, he wore military fatigue, but not uniforms, which I thought was very important. And all his speech was very moderate and I thought that that was something that made this look like not the conflict between some two others that are quite similar to each other and are both goons or something like that but actually between someone who's very much like us and very civilized and someone else who is the most toxic masculinity you can imagine which made you really like Ukraine so that, that's the thing I got in the beginning of the war. My other question is about populism. So to me, Zelensky is the ultimate populist. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. Actually, it's the only example of a populist that you don't look at in a derogatory way. But to an extent, this is such a strong message that he has, right? That people, and that comes from the show, which I have watched, right? That the people should have a say, the people as they are should have a say in politics. And it is anti-elitist, even if not in a dividing kind of way. So to me, you could not be more populist. And, and in fact, a lot of other people that we call populists are not. Whereas Zelensky is the ultimate populism, and in that sense, it does matter for politics because I can't imagine he would do something, um, even if, in regards to decisions about the war and the ending of the war, that isn't what he believes in, in, in line with the majority of Ukrainian people. So to me, like, that's a very important feature in, in Zelensky, him being a populist. Oh, yeah, you are. Uh, I know what I'm gonna let Henry talk about the toxic yeah, masculinity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, in, in the book, like his parents, like as he was a child, did try to kind of toughen him up in the hard scrabble to Nipro. They, you know, kind of because he liked piano and dancing, and so they wanted him to kind of lift weights and stuff like that. But he definitely does not like put that, you know, he doesn't try to be a Putin and, and, and then definitely, you know, he's self-deprecating. You know things like that and, and his comedy is often self-deprecating as well and so i think you know that's interesting i think that's uh yeah i, I think you're on to something in that in terms of the international uh, appeal um in terms of right, just a, you might propose the second question populism. oh populism yeah um uh yeah i think i think it comes down to what your definition of populism is because if it is kind of anti-elite 
right? Kind of people versus elite, then, you know, absolutely. You know, his campaign was very much about, you know, we the people and, and his rhetoric, his speeches. I mean, we talked about this in the book. He's always incorporated, he's using the language of we rather than the language of I, um, you know, which can be very different, right? Or, you know, like in Russia, it would be like Gosudarstva, right? The state, you know, whereas he doesn't talk like that. You know, he talks about we the people and we're kind of, we're all president. Um, and um, I, 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 yeah, so anyway, I, I think there is, there is something to that. But on the other hand, right, it, you know, there, I mean, there are definitions of populism that would, you know, include this sort of intolerant element. And in that sense, he's like the very opposite of that kind of populism. Um, but, you know, kind of getting to the question of, you know, is he just like out of a weather vane, right? Just kind of going with what he thinks the public opinion is. Um, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm not so sure, you know, having gone gone through all of this, I don't, I don't see, you know, I, I do see him kind of standing up for, you know, certain things that seem very consistent to his life story. You know, one is this, um, this sense of identity, this, you know, identification with the civic Ukraine, um, and also kind of part of the idea of um, the, the, the sort of element of populism is part of that, because um, his message is not just about you know, which I think a lot of populists are, is like, I am going to deliver this for you, the people. I am the embodiment of the people and I'm going to do all this, right? You know, his is a message of people having to take responsibility into their own hands to correct their own society. Um, and so, you know, talk about like the problem of corruption, right? Um, you know, there's a, one of the earlier episodes in the first season, um, you know, he's, he's become president and he's talking about, you know, accidentally, and um, he was kind of put on the spot and starts talking about well, where does corruption come from? And, you know, he argues, well, it starts in the delivery room, you know, when parents have to pay the doctor in order to get the medical services. And so the little child, you know, this innocent, uh, you know, child kind of is already exposed to that form of corruption. And then they, they go on to realize or believe that in order to get anything done in their own society, they have to engage in these practices and it becomes normalized. And the only way to stop it is for people at a mass level to stop engaging in these. So in some ways, he's actually kind of blaming the people for some of these problems. I mean, not exactly, right? You know, he recognized the big problem, but, you know, he's not just saying get rid of the elites. You solve the problem, which is kind of a typical populist message. You know, he is saying that people need to take responsibility for their own lives. I mean, his message is, you know, I'm going to help you do that. You know, we're going to do this together. And so that's, you know, again, you could call it populist because it's, you know, he's definitely against the elite's role in this, right? And, and you know, anti-oligarch in his rhetoric. Um, but there is this, people need to take power in their own hands in their own personal level that I think is distinct. And there's there certain messages like that that are visible throughout his performance career, you know, long before he became president, um, you know, along with the sense of identity, you know, other things, once you get down to more concrete policies, then maybe, uh, but, you know, some reforms, if he has to make the choices between what maybe is popular versus what needs to be done to integrate with Europe, um, you know, I'm not sure. My guess is he may lean towards the more painful reforms, um, you know, at, at the expense of the population. That's just my sense. But, uh, you know, again, we won't know until we kind of see later. Because <laughs> so far, I mean, you know, he's, he's had a pretty good ear for public opinion and, you um, you know, what he would use these messages resonated, but then you know, there'll be times when this will diverge and, and then we'll see what happens. More questions? So, oh, sorry, sorry. No, I just, I wanted to say that uh, I agree with Henry's take and I just wanted to stress that in many of his speeches, um, be they the formal speeches he gives as president or the many recordings that he made on his various devices and, and uh, that are present on, on his uh, multiple uh, different social media accounts. He uses the language of duty um, and he stresses repeatedly uh, that element. And this is why we made civic duty and, 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 and the kind of theories around it when it comes to uh, democratizing context, uh, such a central element in the book because it's very much there in his language. And I think it resonates uh, with those people who did grow up in Ukraine, uh, who remember, uh, as Henry says, this is, you know, this is a, 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 an element in, in the servant of the people, but ordinary Ukrainians 
know exactly where and when they had to pay bribes and even those people who perceive themselves as not being corrupt in any way were faced with certain situations where they perhaps did have to. Um, and I think those things, when they are described in his speeches, that if you are paying that very small, seemingly insignificant small fish bribe, you are part of the problem. If you are taking a little bit more off the delivery truck than you should or whatever it is, the example, then you are part of the problem. Um, I think that really resonates with people uh, because they they. They, they see it as, as being true, that it's not simply about the oligarchic class, which he certainly highlights in, in, in many of his speeches, but it's also about the systemic endemic, uh, seemingly corruption in, in the society. Um, and several of my friends said that there was particularly one, his, um, his, not, his inauguration speech, that they felt shame when they heard that segment of that inauguration speech because they said to themselves, Dean, it's true. Uh, I did pay those bribes. I did behave in that way. And I'm, you know, in that sense, I was part of the problem. Now I have to change my behavior. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm uh, Robert Greenberg, visiting scholar here at the Harriman Institute and a Dean and Professor at University of Auckland in New Zealand. Um, thank you for uh, your, your book and really look forward to reading it. I just was wanting to probe a little more, more deeply into, if you could, on Zelensky's Jewish identity. Um, a lot is made of it, it's mentioned often, but I wonder how much of his decision making, his mindset, his personality might be shaped by his Jewishness, his values, um, his upbringing. If you had any chance to look into that aspect more deeply, um, I, I just curious, I, I can see the connection between his Jewishness and his civic identity, that's, that's obvious and clear, but are there other aspects, let's this, such as the last thing, Olya, you mentioned about the anti, the sense on corruption, on, on a value system, on, or you know, was there any religiosity in his background? I somehow doubt it, but I don't know, so I'm really just curious what you might have discovered in your research. Thanks. Henry, you want to go? Uh, he, he, he's not, his family, his children are all christened, actually, and he's not a practicing Jew, right? And I think that's the way he talks about it. He doesn't talk about um, coming from a religious family. Um, and But he has mentioned uh, repeatedly um, his uncles and descendants that um, were either persecuted or uh, that died in the Holocaust. And this is where he has uh, made that connection. But in my, at least my understanding, he, 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 he did not grow up in a religious family. I don't know, Henry, did I, if I got that wrong. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, no, I mean, yeah, I, I think all I would say is, uh, you know, we didn't, at least I didn't encounter any like interviews with him, for example, kind of probing this. Um, and we didn't have the chance to interview him in person, which would be really fascinating to do. So, um, you know, I, I do think that's sort of an aspect of his identity that it would be really interesting to look into. So I, I don't have any other, you know, strong answers other than that. Right. I mean, you know, he clearly, um, you know, one of his uh, grandfathers is like the only survivor in, in his family of the Holocaust, right? So clearly, you know, this has to have had impacted him somehow, right? You know, what we don't really know is what, how. And I, I think like in the book, we don't want to kind of go out on any limbs without having really researched this and thought about it. And that's not really our sure. uh, kind of area of expertise. Uh, but I do think it's, it's a very interesting question. It, it could be that it's almost taken out of, well, it might be exaggerated, some of it, the, the claims, you know, oh, the first, he's a Jewish president, and especially when, when Putin is, is speaking about the, the you know, the neo-Nazis in Kiev, and then here everybody says, well, they have a Jewish president. Would you think it might be somewhat of that, some of that going on, or? No, I mean, he... Anti-Semitism. Well, he seems to have more of a Ukrainian civic identity stronger than so, so, so many others. We just wonder um, if, if that Jewish card is is, a, is an added sort of thing there, but not necessarily salient. But I guess as, what, as some people make it. But I guess my you know my my sense is he's really not that different from all you know. You, Ukraine's very diverse, right? Yeah. It's uh, you know got lots of people who have you know they fall in different places on lots of different. Cleavages, you know, different people come from different ethnic heritages, different languages, different religions. Um, they often kind of cross cut 
regions have their own identity. So, you know, I, I guess I, I don't notice anything along the lines you're talking about that would single out and I would say, okay, yes, that is clearly, you know, an influence from his Jewish heritage. Um, you know, again, maybe there would be something there that someone could identify, but, um, you know, that's not my sense. I mean, he doesn't hide it, right? It's not yeah. like, um, you know, he, you know he, he talks frankly about this and people know it. Um, so, you know, that's clearly significant, but, um, you know, it, it does fit with his just general attitude towards Ukraine as a diverse country, uh, you know, and, and diverse and free, and that's sort of his message. But I don't think that grows out in particular, you know, from his ethnic background, um, as opposed to, you know, just his experience as one of many Ukrainians coming up, um, you know, growing up in this particular generation. I think the point is he is uh, he is of Jewish heritage and that's how he describes it himself. But above all, he feels he's Ukrainian and right uh, by the passport. Um, and he is not the first major Ukrainian politician uh, that that is Jewish and uh, two prime ministers, in fact. So it, it, I think it goes to the point when people sometimes perhaps stress these elements, both of um, uh, past prime ministers or, or, or of, of, of Zelensky, is that this hasn't been an issue in Ukraine that would make someone unelectable, right? Whereas perhaps in some countries, it's still something that would be questioned about a candidate's electability, right? And that's certainly what has not been the case in Ukraine. Um, and that's not to say that there aren't small minority groups within Ukrainian electoral constituencies that perhaps are anti-Semitic or have a very different vision of Ukraine. They are by far the minority, um, and certainly it, it wouldn't be an issue for any politician in Ukraine. I think that's the point. It hasn't been, and it wouldn't be, and therefore um, connecting him to a radical right-wing Nazism is absurd. Um, it really is. Um, but it would be absurd also for several other major politicians in Ukraine. I just want to say one thing about the, the masculinity question. Um, I think, you know, he sometimes he's dressed up in, in the uniform in full, um, so that you just have to do a little bit more scouring on the internet for those images. Um, uh, but there is an authenticity to him and how he behaves how he is in the public sphere right um and then i think there perhaps is also an authenticity to putin's version of masculinity as well i mean i don't know for really personally but it seems authentic to him um other major politicians in ukraine have tried to actually take on board this very um very particular more hard uh, masculinity. And that has been Petro Poroshenko and his usage of army uniforms and then the manner in which he would speak whilst wearing that uniform. And it didn't work well for him. In fact, it polled really poorly and also was uh, perceived negatively in focus groups. And another infamous case of uh, Yatsenyuk in his candidacy years back, years, years back, um, he had a very problematic campaign where his team branded him as like uh, the, the new Bandera uh, type figure in the posters. He was, it was all green camouflage colored and he was wearing the uniform and he was trying to look more tough because he had this image of being the Zaychik, the bunny rabbit in, in Ukrainian politics, that he was too soft with his Ugg boots that he loved so much. And, uh, it failed, it crashed and burned because it didn't work for him. And so I think Zelensky by just being how he is and 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 not trying to be a version of what is perceived to be the right, strong, hard, masculine politician uh, worked um, because perhaps society has moved along and those branding teams and politicians didn't get the memo. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hi, my name is Victoria. I'm a teacher scholar here at Harvard Institute and I'm teaching every day at Central European University in Austria. And I have two questions, but one of them is poorly formulated. So I will start with a with a better formulated one. Uh, 
the Rad supposed to have an elections in a year, the presidential elections in a year from now in Ukraine. And I'm wondering, obviously, this is not the um, first thing on the agenda uh, right now, but at the same time, there will be some kind of electoral competition and elections themselves. And part of the electoral campaign of Zelensky was um, the, the statement that he made about him willing to be there just for one term and not for two terms. And I guess it is changing right now, and I'm wondering in which way. And I'm also wondering if there are any, if there is any window for actual political competition right now, because it seems that Zelensky has so much of a trust and um, yeah, of public trust that it's really difficult to, to compete with him. Um, so is there anything like that that um, uh, you observed, like uh, another political figure that can actually be a real opponent uh, in the upcoming elections? And the second question, the poorly formulated one, um, is about how the narratives that he is using right now, um, how he utilizes certain things that are happening during the war as a political figure. Because while he's um, a leader of a nation and a very important person to unite Ukraine, he's also a politician. And it seems that it was also mentioned during this conversation that he's very um, flexible or like sensitive to what the majority of Ukrainians think and that he has to represent this majority. While it seems that there is a very diverse water experience right now in Ukraine. And also, I mean, that there are certain regions, eastern regions and people from eastern regions which experienced good and one thing, while people from the western regions experienced very different thing. It seems that they have slightly different interests, but I don't have any data on that. This is just like feeling from conversations with Ukrainians from different parts of Ukraine. But they have very different expectations, very different desires about this work. And we also observed how the um, narratives during the war, they radicalized or they became very different from what he was saying in the very beginning. And it's also about defending back certain territories or getting over certain territories. So um, how exactly do you think this works for him as political figure and um, how much of the decisions that he's making are, I don't wanna you know, romanticize politicians and say that, oh, they have to, I don't know, just be the best people and protect everybody. Um, but how much of it is him being a politician and how much of him is him trying to stop the war or resolve the conflict? Henry, do you want to go first or? Does it matter? Um, well, you have to leave. Okay, so. yeah, I, I could just briefly, I'm not going to run out right in the middle of all you're talking, but uh, I mean, I guess in terms of the, um, uh, the election, um, yeah, I mean, he said he would only stay one term in office, he probably has the best excuse any politician could have to um, reverse that decision. Um, it does seem like Ukraine has the capacity to conduct an election now through the, the DIA app. I mean, so much is now um, virtual, right? And, you know, good security, things like that, it could probably happen. So it does seem like now that, that you're going to have um, elections, um, but exactly the competition Probably just so much depends on what happens between now and then, um, you know, during wartime. I mean, yeah, it is hard to imagine what sort of competition there could be, you know, it, during kind of the all out war um, going on. I mean, the other figures that might conceivably be popular, you know, could be like Zeluzny or somebody like that, who is very much part of that war effort. And you're not going to see a split between them. I'm confident. Um, you know, at, at that time, you know, my guess is that probably, you know, there might be a token opposition or something like that, but that most people would still set aside, you know, they, they'd find some level on which they could give people a choice, but um, probably still put off the, the real discussions until after the war, because it's, it, I mean, at least for me, it's hard for me to imagine. I'm interested in what other people, uh, you know, think, think about that. Um, and just very briefly in terms of um, 
how much is is politics and how much is the war. Um, I mean, I, I guess my you know my my my, my sense is that um, you know for him it is the war because his political future is going to depend on the war. And I think that you know if if, if he uses the opportunity to centralize power too much in a way that undercuts the war effort, um, it's going to still play badly for him later. Um, you know, the, the problem that comes with leadership, of course, is you come to equate the success of the nation with you yourself, right? So you can't rule out that, uh, you know, because there, there's tension now with decentralization, right? Ukraine's decentralization reform, which has been, by all accounts, remarkably successful, right? Initiated in 2014, um, accelerated uh, under Zelensky as well. Um, and it's really helped empower a lot of it and, and give people a sense of uh, you know, uh, efficacy that uh, has helped undergird and support this mobilization against the Russian aggressor, right? And that there's a conflict between that. On one hand, this has facilitated the mobilization, but on the one hand, the logic of military command and control is centralization. And so there has been tension there, right? And, you know, it's hard to say, well, is this politics or is this, uh, you know, kind of the war effort, because, you know, probably from the perspective of, of Zelensky and probably from the perspective of the military, um, you know, it, it's it's in the interest of the country that there be centralized command to some degree, you know, recognizing some need for local, local autonomy among commanders, you know, it's a balance, but, um, you know, it would be interpreted as for the country. Um, but I think I see that's where there probably is some tension, but probably that's how it, it's framed. And that's going to be an important, the Ukraine's going to have to strike that balance because if there's too much centralization going in, you know, you don't want to stifle the autonomy of local communities and even like local commanders. That was part of the military reform was decentralizing command, right? That's been a key part of Ukraine's success, right? You don't want to stifle that and adopt the Russian system, which is, the, you know, everything stops with Putin um, and therefore often stops. Um, so I think that's got it's got to be the key. Um, oh yeah, yeah, that's figures, yeah. yeah. Uh, the we we've conducted three um, series of omnibus surveys. Uh, with two of those um, are in the book, and obviously the February twenty twenty three one that just came out, February March twenty twenty three one that just came out. Um, uh, wasn't in a book, but uh, we repeatedly asked about if, you know, the, the classic question, if an election was uh, to take place this Sunday, which obviously, as Henry already explained, um, you get a little bit of a rally effect around Zelensky. Uh, uh, he is by far the top candidate, right? Um, and that hasn't changed in any of the surveys we've conducted in a year in. I was still surprised that the February, March 2023 um, question was nearly identical, right? So Poroshenko gets about 5% and Zelensky's at about 75%, 76%. Um, when you compare that to the, the experimental uh, survey items, uh, Zelensky's support in election falls to maybe 55%. Um, uh, but nonetheless, he, he is about like he's the only one that could win an election, right? Um, there's no other clear candidates. Uh, there's certain candidates we don't include in the list to choose from, uh, but people have volunteered these candidates uh, in the open text option that none of these candidates suit me. Z Zaluzhny's uh, is an interesting one because of the about 2% that answer that uh that select another candidate would be would be uh, the one who I vote for. Um, initially in May 2022, 10% of those 2% said Zaluzhny. Uh, by July 2023, sorry, that's supposed to be, that's a typo, 2022, 20% uh, of that 2% said Zaluzhny, and now 40% uh, of that 2%. So if we do add him as a, can, a potential candidate to that uh, list in the survey, it would be interesting to see how, how many folks would, um, would actually choose him. Uh, we ran some analyses with a friend who knows a lot more about this than I do, uh, it, trying to estimate the real support for Zolution based on all these things that we have. Uh, and even there, he wouldn't get more than Poroshenko at this time. So... Really, there's no current competition for um, Zelensky, I don't think, electorally. Um, I don't know how doable elections are, but I, I can see there being pressures to have them. Uh, I think also there would be, there. 
I think there's a way not to have elections right now that wouldn't be a democratic. I, I, so there's, I think, a, a lot of discussion um, about the decisions around the elections and how they will be held. And will they, in fact, be uh, a good thing to do or not? And how will they be conducted? Um, but what's interesting to note is another question we've been asking. And again, in the book, we refer to the July 2022 data, but now we have fresh data um, after a year. And among these candidates that you we just listed for you, uh, who would be better to cope with the task of rebuilding Ukraine? And back in July 2022, uh, so just what, eight, eight or so months ago, um, nine months ago, 55% um, of the population um, said Zelensky. Only 4% uh, said Poroshenko. Groisman, interestingly, a former prime minister, got as much as Poroshenko. Um, but... Uh, now, um, there's actually been an increase in those folks who think uh, Zelensky would be good at coping. And that's statistically significant as far as we can estimate this with the issues of sampling. But the sampling would be the same in, in July as it is now in February, March, right? So there is an increase in the number of people who think. Um, and I checked who are these people, and they are from the west of Ukraine. So that's, an uh, I think, an interesting also development that... As the war has gone on, more people think that he will be better at um, re coping at rebuilding Ukraine. And I think there's a bigger issue here. Um, just stop the share. There's a bigger issue here happening. Um, and I think that's something Henry and I have exchanged some WhatsApp messages about. Uh, there's a, been a, this, this radicalization that you referred to. I'm not sure it's radicalization. I think it's also just there are new issues that are now the reality of everyday Ukraine, right? And they are, Ukraine is militarized, Ukraine is nationalized in a lot of ways, and um, and it's patriotic, right? And that kind of goes across the board of different uh, constituencies in Ukraine. Um, but in that sense, he has stepped on the policy sphere of some other parties who are now kind of flailing. Um, they don't have an identity, a brand, a policy direction that is their own, right? And increasingly, uh, at least in the case of, of one party, it seems to be an anti-Zelensky, uh, anti-state uh, message rather than um, a key policy message that makes them uniquely different from the other competitors. Because if your Atlantis's policies, if your Ukrainization, if military, the, the, the strength of the military, not bargaining with Russia, not giving up, all these things are now within the policy territory and sphere and discourse, as you just mentioned of Zelensky, they are actually not on solid ground when it comes to an election, right? Because it's very difficult to identify what they stand for and how will they be any different from Zelensky and his party or other uh, opposition parties. Um, and my worry is that some of these opposition parties will turn to uh, a critique of civic national identity as being good for the country. Um, and that's already started in some of their discourses publicly. Um, and uh, I would say that that's something really important to watch in the lead up to any potential election. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, this has been a, a really long and uh, quite interesting session, and I have to recommend that you buy this book. It's very readable, and the quotes from Zelensky are peppered throughout the book in a really effective way. Um, it's I'm really happy for you guys. You wrote a great book, and uh, it's timely, it's important, and um, necessary. So, moving into the book. And those of you at home, <laughs> come again. We have uh, more, more interesting um, talks coming up. So check out our website. And thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you so much. It's so nice to meet you. Were you really there during the, or when were you there in the afternoon? Oh, I don't know.